So welcome every day to today's webinar. Uh, we will bring together different perspectives, legal and uh, more political on uh, the Yugoslav wars, uh, which started in 1991, but of course still uh, reverberate today. This webinar is hosted by uh, IFESA and uh, VRG. Uh, IFESA is a nonprofit organization uh, that wants to bridge the gap between academia and the broader public. And we organize uh, freely accessible events with leading academic voices mm. in both popular and lesser known disciplines. Uh, this is our third webinar in our COVID era uh, series of events, uh, which you can all find on our website, uh, www.ifesa.be. And you can support us by uh, either attending our events or becoming a member if you wish. Um, and VRG, the other organization who is also organizing today, um, is the Leuven chapter of the Flemish Law Student Association, uh, which was founded in 1885 and continues uh, to support the student community at the law faculty in Leuven uh, today. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming two persons who have devoted a significant part of their career to the events and consequences uh, of the conflicts that rocked the Balkans in the last decade of the 20th century. Uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Christine van der Weingaert is an internationally recognized expert on international criminal law. She started her career as a professor in criminal law at the University of Antwerp and later served as a judge on the International Criminal Tribunal for the former mm -hmm. Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Court, as well as the International Court of Justice as a justice ad hoc. In recognition of her service, she received several honorary uh, doctorates, as well as the title of Baroness. Mm. Professor van der Weingart continues to serve on the steering committee of the <laughs> Crimes Against Humanity initiatives and continues to write in the fields of international criminal law and uh, accountability for, uh, for war crimes. Uh, Professor van der Weingart will speak about her role as a judge at the Yugoslavia Tribunal and her experiences about the discrepancy of the idealism uh, of the task of a judge and the results that the tribunal uh, booked in terms of the reconciliation of the conflict itself. We also have uh, Dr. Anna Milosevic, who is joining us. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the LINK, which is the Leuven Institute of Criminology at uh, the KU Leuven uh, Law Faculty. Her research focuses on memorialization processes, the creation and uh, instrumentalization of collective memories, if I get that correctly. Um, she has recently published a book on Europeanization and uh, European integration. Uh, and Memory Politics in the Western Balkans, co-edited with uh, Tamara Trost, which explores how the processes of European integration have influenced collective memory in the countries in the Western Balkans. Under her alter ego, The Memory Hunter, she mm -hmm. documents and comments on recent and past monuments and memorials. You can follow her ongoing memory hunts on Twitter. Uh, yeah. Dr. Milosevic will speak about the impact of Europeanization on narratives and memory politics in the Western Balkans and its consequences for reconciliation and dealing uh, with the uh, past uh, memories of the 1990s in the Balkans. Today's webinar will be structured as follows. First, each speaker will present for 20 minutes on their topic. And after that, we foresee some time for the speakers to engage on their respective topics. We will then open up the floor to questions from the audience. And this webinar is scheduled to stop at 4 p.m. sharp. Uh, please use the chat function to submit any questions you may mm. have on YouTube. Those questions will be forwarded to us and we'll try our utmost to address all of them. Finally, I would like to uh, note that this webinar is being live streamed on YouTube and that a recording will be made available uh, for you. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, give the floor to um, Professor van der Weingart, who will be sharing her PowerPoint presentation uh, in a second. Mrs. van der Weingart, you have the floor. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And it's a pleasure for me to speak to this very um, diversified group. I understand uh, many people from many countries uh, looking at uh, this webinar. So um, what I will do is try to share some of my experience as a judge um, in the Yugoslavia tribunal. Um, and also as um, the introducer has said, um, my general assessment about what my role as a judge could be, could have been, 
and what I see as the possible impact of a tribunal of the kind that we have seen. And so I will use uh, a presentation that I'm now going to try to share with you. I thought I had already clicked it on a while ago, but it doesn't seem to have worked. So let me try to do this again, share screen. Here you put it. So the title of my presentation is International Criminal Justice in the Balkans um, and focusing on the ICTY. I will start with a historical perspective. How do I mm. put these on the full screen? Um, I'm not... Yes, maybe that's a better one. So that, that's um, the outline of my presentation. So I will start with some history, historical perspective. Then I will focus on the ICTY. And then um, I will go into the question of the contribution of such a, a court, the ICTY, to international justice in general and international mm -hmm. justice in the Balkans. And maybe these questions um, need to be differently answered. So a quick look into the history, I, I won't dwell long on it, but it's important to note that, because now we think of uh, the ICTY, uh, the, um, what we have, the, the tribunal, is something um, as part of the toolbox of the, the instrumentarium of what, mm -hmm. what we have to deal with uh, conflicts and to try to achieve re reconciliation after the conflicts. But in fact, this is a very mm -hmm. um, recent um, thing. Uh, we only started thinking of that um, a bit more than 100 years ago with um, the, um, the, oh, it's gone. I thought I could switch between my presentation and the screen, but. I'm sorry, I've done that with other presentations, but this time it doesn't seem to work. Huh? Um, just bear with me for a sec. So what do I do now? I should Microsoft OneDrive, um, webinar Yugoslavia, share screen. Anyone with the link? Sorry. If for any reason uh, I would hear that the, the audio drops away, I will let you know. Because <laughs> yes. You, yes, you can see the, uh, the presenter screen. So uh, don't worry. Um, I, I used to toggle between my presentation and the, um, and the um, PowerPoint, but that doesn't seem to work anymore. So let me just stay where I am now and uh, stay with in the presentation. So historical perspective, this whole story of um, thinking of um, international crimes and trying to have an international response to this started um, after the First World, World War with the, um, the idea in the, in the Treaty of Versailles that the, the German Kaiser Wilhelm II should be put um, uh, to justice. This was one of the ideas that was put into the, um, the Treaty of Versailles, um, but that didn't work out because um, states were not really, they, they were pay, paying lip service to the idea, but they probably were not really prepared to, to do such a thing as, as putting um, a, a former uh, Kaiser to, to, to justice. And so it didn't happen. Uh, can you see this? Because my, my, let me try to put this away. Yeah, yes, we can see it. Yeah. So this was a, a, a cartoon that that was um, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the newspapers at the time. You see here the Treaty of Versailles, the piece of paper, and then the German Kaiser uh, walking out of it and uh, getting refuge in the Netherlands. That's that's where he he was given asylum, and then the next stage in this um, historical narrative is that. Um, really the fact that we there was no punishment after the first world war not about uh, what happened uh, in um, europe 
but also what happened in, in, in Turkey, Armenia. Um, and so this is a, a very well-known quote from Hitler on the day, um, a few days before the invasion of Poland uh, in, in 1938. That's what he said to his troops when he was um, um, speaking to his generals who were going to invade Poland. That's what he said. Our strength lies in our intensive attacks and our barbarity. And after all, who today remembers the genocide of the Armenians? Um, and during the, the, the war hmm, that um, um, burst out after that, um, the Allied powers um, made it very clear that in this case, they were really going to be serious about setting up an international tribunal. You had um, not, not only the, the typical war crimes that you would have found in, in other wars, but even much worse, the genocide, uh, Auschwitz, crime against humanity. Um, and that's where this idea of crimes against humanity as a concept um, originated, because before that, war crimes um, and international humanitarian law, war crimes were a subject of international humanitarian law. Um, these crimes were about committing crimes against people of the other side against civilians of, of the enemy, against enemy soldiers. Here, crimes against humanity was about committing crimes against your own population, which was a quantum shift at the time. So um, after the Second World War, the International Military Tribunal was set up um, in Nuremberg. Um, and this was really, really the first um, international tribunal in, in, in not only in modern history, but in history in general. And so here, um, this tribunal really paved the way to the way we think about international criminal justice today, let alone the vocabulary. You know, at the time it wasn't obvious how these crimes, these hor horrendous crimes committed by the Nazis would be called, what names they would be called by. And that's where we have this first use of the word um, war crime. We had um, regulations on, 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 on the conduct of war, but the real notion of crime, a war crime, uh, was only uh, formulated for the first time in the Nuremberg Charter. Even more, um, more spectacular was the notion of crime against humanity. Crime against humanity is a crime, as I was just saying, committed against the own population. And this is something that was uh, covered by sovereignty before states had this sort of sovereign right to, to do whatever they wanted to do at home with their population. Crimes against humanity made an end to that. And so that was part of our vac vocabulary, genocide, of course, and the crime of, of aggression. And so this Nuremberg Tribunal with all its flaws really uh, paved the way to this, this new way of looking at um, international uh, conflicts and at, at the way in which international conflicts lead to be followed up after uh, their closure. You had the, um, the Yugoslavia tribunal and you also had uh, um, national prosecutions. This is the Eichmann trial uh, in Jerusalem. And those who have studied philosophy will certainly have read Anna Arendt. Hannah Arendt, a German philosopher who was sitting in the court in, 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 um, in Tel Aviv watching this trial. And she wrote this famous book about the banality of evil. We had prosecutions in France and in, in, um, in Germany. But the idea to have a permanent court after Nuremberg uh, just fell um, with the Cold War because the, the idea had been to have Nuremberg followed up by a permanent international court. The uh, International Law Commission's, Commission was working on that. And um, then the Cold War came and the political willingness disappeared. And it took till the Balkan Wars, um, till the early 1990s of the past century for states to be willing again to put together an international uh, tribunal. And that is what then became the ICTY or the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So this was now a new uh, international tribunal, more really international than the um, Nuremberg Tribunal because in the ICTY um, it was a court set up by the United Nations. It was a very special thing for this court to be set up by 
the um, Security Council. This is the, the photograph. Uh, those who have been in The Hague will have seen this building. So this is where the, the Yugoslavia Tribunal has been functioning um, until a couple of years ago because it has now closed doors and um, it's doing its last cases, but this is really something that is going to, to disappear um, um, soon. And so this was a tribunal set up by the Security Council, which in and of itself is perhaps not an obvious thing because how can an executive organ of an international organization set up a court of law, a judicial organ? Um, and of course, as you can imagine, the first um, accused before the ICTY were challenging the, um, the existence of such a court because they said, well, it's not, not um, a proper way to set up a court. A court can only be set up by a treaty. But here, um, at this time, um, states were prepared to accept that. I'm sure they would not be able to do it today. The political willingness would probably not exist today. But that's what happened then. Um, and we had this famous prosecutor whom you may, may remember, Carla Del Ponte, the Swiss lady who was a prosecutor for many years. And then now we have the uh, Serge Brammers, uh, the Belgian prosecutor who is doing the last cases of the court. Um, the court has been quite successful in the sense of um, bringing to justice 161 individuals, which is a lot if you compare it to other tribunals, uh, to the I ICC in the first place, has um, done much less cases in the time that it has been existing, or even the tribunal in Cambodia or uh, the Sierra Leone tribunal. So here, yeah, 161 individuals, um, not the least important ones. We had a trial of Milosevic. I'm sorry that he did not survive to see the case ended. He, he uh, died while in, in prison. We had Karacic, we had Milosevic. So here really the, um, the most important um, accused persons of um, the ICTY have been brought to justice. Here you may remember this spectacular last case uh, before the appeals chamber in The Hague, where um, Mr. Praljac, one of the Croatian accused, uh, committed su suicide during the last hearing. This was really a very um, spectacular end. So this is the ICTY, and mm -hmm. let me now zo zoom in a little bit on my own um, time there. And the ICTY was um, set up in 1993, while the conflict was still fully ongoing. Um, and you may remember Srebrenica took place in 1995. So um, the mere existence of the tribunal has certainly not have had this deterrent effect that it could um, avoid um, massacres of that type taking place. So here you see me taking my oath in this tribunal composed of judges from all over the world. Um, it's also uh, interesting perhaps for you to know that this is an elected function. So it's something that you are not appointed to, but you have to go through an election process in the United Nations, in the General Assembly of the United Nations. And so you have judges from, you see a South African judge sitting next to me, Judge Malotto. Uh, there's a, a Spanish judge. Um, so this was really an international tribunal in the sense that we were not representing states but we were representing the international community. We were elected by the international community, which is a very big difference with Nuremberg where you only had judges from those states who had won the second world war. You had only judges from France, from the United States, from Russia and the United Kingdom. And also the idea uh, of um, an even handed prosecution um, was absent there because only crimes committed by the Germans and by the Japanese were put to trial, but not crimes committed by the, the other side. For example, Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, has never been put before um, the Nuremberg Tribunal. And here the difference of this tribunal is that it um, was looking at all the sides in the conflict. Uh, I will get to that in a moment. So, um, Here you see my first case. I was in, in a, a trial with uh, an Australian presiding judge and uh, a judge from Sweden, Judge Telin. 
And so this was the first um, one of the first accused that I um, have been sitting on, uh, a general, uh, General Strugar, who was um, prosecuted for having bombed the, the city of Dubrovnik. You remember Dubrovnik, a very um, UNESCO classified protected city. And in the very beginning of the conflict, the, the Serbs under his command shelled the city of Dubrovnik. It was also something that we went to look at in the area. And just to give you an idea, judges don't sit only in the courtroom, most of the time they do, but if necessary, then they go to the, the, the area and they look at positions um, that are important for them to, to, to see what the evidence means. In this case, we had heard uh, witnesses coming to, to speak of um, where the Serbs had their position and where the Croats had their positions. And here we were standing on a hill on the side of Dubrovnik, looking at the city of Dubrovnik just below. And this was a way for us um, in which we could assess um, what um, was in the evidence. And in the end, I'm not going to go into the case, I wouldn't have the time for that. Uh, but so this was um, an important part of the trial. And so here, these are cases, are my cases that I've done at the ICTY. And it also shows you the geography of the conflict. Here, um, Strugar and Mirksic, or the of of Chara case, were cases of crimes um, committed in um, Croatia. Um, my last case, Limay, was a case uh, of a crime committed in Kosovo. This was, Boskowski was a crime committed in Macedonia. Lukic and Lukic was a very famous case of crimes committed in Bosnia. So. This shows also in my own practice, but in the overall practice of the court, that the court was broad in the sense that cases have been brought, investigations have been carried out, not only against the Serbs, but also against Croat accused, also against uh, Kosovar, against Macedonian accused. So in that sense, it was a step forward as compared to Nuremberg, which was only one-sided looking at crimes committed <coughs> by, um, the Germans and the Japanese. This is my next tribunal. Um, the, I'm not going to deal with that, but uh, at the end of the, um, the Balkans War in 1999, those who have studied it may um, know that part of the history. And there was um, um, the bombing of Kosovo by of Belgrade, I'm sorry, by, by NATO in, tr in, in order to try and stop Milosevic to go on in um, Kosovo in the same way as he had gone uh, about um, Bosnia and to, in order to, to avoid um, that happening, NATO bombed Kosovo, drove Milosevic out of power. Um, and um, that was the end of the Yugoslavia tribunal. The, the states did not want to prolong the tribunal. But of course, um, in this last part of the war, Kosovar um, um, persons, liberation fighters, as they call themselves, also committed crimes um, um, on the territory of Kosovo. And the Serbs were of the view that it was unfair that this was not, uh, that only they had, had been prosecuted, but that there was no equivalent um, for what uh, allegedly happened uh, on the other side. And that's how after uh, the ending of the Yugoslavia tribunal, this new tribunal was set up, the Kosovo specialist chambers, um, who are now starting to function and who um, their, one of their first important cases is going to be against Mr. Tachi and others. Tachi, who is um, the former president of um, Kosovo and who allegedly also uh, committed um, serious crimes um, in the 1990s. And this is for me my last um, tribunal because I'm also uh, sitting as a judge in that court. So let us dwell on this question about what has been the role of the ICTY um, did it contribute to international criminal justice in general, and then more in particular uh, in the Balkans? Because of course that was the purpose of, of this court, um, to be a plus value and to, in, in the end, it was not an explicit 
purpose, but um, in the end, it was also meant to contribute to peace. No justice without peace, no peace without justice, to, to, to enhance some um, reconciliation. And I must say, for me, um, this was an important thing when I was, let me go back a few slides, when I was sitting in this case, not the Strugar case, who this person who was accused of having bombed um, uh, Dubrovnik, a major cultural city, one of the most beautiful spots in the world, I was just wondering how different it would be if I would have been sitting as a judge in a case where my, the city of Antwerp would have been destroyed and where my cathedral, the beautiful cathedral of Antwerp would have been destroyed, would I have been the same uh, degree of objectivity? Of course, judges, all the judges should be objective, but maybe I thought that one of the, the plus values was that I, I was looking at it from a more distant view and perhaps um, a little bit more independent than people normally are um, when um, they sit, judges sit in situations that affect um, themselves. Um, and I also had this view and hope that what I would, was doing there as a judge, my contribution together with my fellow judges uh, of the ICTY was to, to help the region getting back on its feet, to sort of take care of the hot potatoes, to take Milosevic, to take Karadzic, Mladic away from the region, um, because I thought it would be politically, morally impossible for the region to, to be so, uh, to, to be engaging in prosecutions of these persons uh, in the fragile state in which the, the, the post-Yugoslavia uh, states were in, in, in the 1990s. This was what I thought would be our contribution um, and would be then the contribution also to to the history writing part of it. So these are the points that I want to go over quickly. I'm looking at my time. So um, was there any progress after Nuremberg? Uh, the jurisprudence, history writing, what about the victims? Progress after Nuremberg certainly because the ICTY um, uh, well, what was built learning the lessons from Nuremberg and improving on it. As I was saying, it was a real international tribunal. It was um, not a tribunal representing states, but it was representing the international community. So from that um, point of view, it was not a victor's court. One could argue um, that um, maybe in some respect, the ICTY was not totally independent because technically speaking, the NATO bombings in 1999 would have come within the jurisdiction of the court. So um, it could have been possible for the court to also investigate what had happened there because 500 civilians were killed there. So it was not really something um, probably totally innocent, but here you could see that it was a security council tribunal because by the time the prosecutor wanted to investigate in that direction, she was um, kindly um, asked to stop. If you read the memoirs of Carla Del Ponte, uh, you will find more about that. So that's perhaps a, a little point to make, but all by all, this was a huge progress um, from that perspective as compared to Nuremberg. In terms of jurisprudence, the ICTY made um, a huge jurisprudence, um, many cases, 161 people, as I was saying earlier, and it really developed the law in a fantastic manner. Um, for example, in the first case of the, before the court, in the Tadic case, the court decided that the, um, the law of war, international humanitarian law, I'm now simplifying a little bit, but uh, the, 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 the idea was that, um, the law of war should also apply to civil wars, not only to international wars between two states. That was the classical way war crimes were looked at. But in this very first case, the ICTY said, no, it is also possible to apply to domestic wars. And that made the whole body of international humanitarian law um, made applicable to the situation in the former Yugoslavia, because otherwise, um, it would um, probably have had a very limited application. 
another thing, oh, there's so many examples, but I'm just uh, taking another example that is the crime of rape as a war crime, rape as a crime against humanity. That didn't exist. So under the traditional laws of war, um, rape could pro perhaps be prosecuted as an inhuman act or as an act of uh, physical assault, but not as a crime in and of its own right. And in the jurisprudence of the ICTY, this has developed and the, um, the, the, the court has applied um, the notion of rape as a war crime to the facts that were before it. So the jurisprudence really, um, I think, has been very important and very um, 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 helpful. Are you still there? Yes, we are. We are um, <laughs> so <laughs> watching I'm, with interest. I, I, don't, I don't see anybody and, and uh, it's a bit awkward. As I was saying, I usually toggle between the two, but I, I'm not going to do that anymore because the, the um, we I see you anyway. We see you and we see the presentation as well. Sorry? We see you and we see the presentation. Oh, you see me too. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's Excellent. Good. Yeah. Indeed. Oh, what I wanted. I don't see you. It's terrible, but you can see me. That's good. So, um, progress after Nuremberg, yes, but perhaps not, not, not 100%. Jurisprudence, very good, because here the ICTY developed Nuremberg. Nuremberg didn't really give meat to the, these concepts of war crimes, crimes against humanity. Uh, and this is really what, what, what the ICTY did, did very well. Um, history writing, J judges as historians. And here, um, I must say, when I, I came to the ICTY, I really thought I was going to contribute to, to writing history. Uh, this was uh, perhaps a quite naive perspective I had because in the course of um, sitting there in these trials, I realized that this was not my task, but that this was, was not also something I, 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 I was trained for. And also, um, the most important point is that as a judge, you are looking at the evidence of a case. You are looking at the evidence that the prosecutor brings before you, and you can't go beyond that. Hmm? But to give you an example, um, this Strugar case. Huh? This Mr. Strugar was a, a Yugoslav general in the Yugoslav army, but there were people above him as well um, who had not been indicted. So if they had not been indicted, there was no way in which we as judges could take that into account or could, could even say anything about the, these other people. So our history writing, even if we felt on the evidence that was before us that other people should have been mentioned as well, should perhaps have been put to trial, uh, it's something we couldn't do because we are we were limited by, by the cases. And that's, that's what tribunals do. You can't blame a tribunal for that because it's the, the, the task of a criminal court just to look at what the prosecutor brings and to judge within the, the boundaries of what, what prosecutors bring, bring before you. Also, um, the burden of evidence. The burden of evidence in a criminal court is very high. The prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person who is indicted, the accused, has committed a crime. Now, if you have to decide that this burden has not been met, that not enough evidence has brought uh, to that effect. We have to acquit, but it doesn't mean that the crime has not been committed. So all these things are the, the, the core of criminal trials, but have nothing to do with history writing. So that's why after my own experience, I really came to realize that um, that this was not our task, that we couldn't even do it because it, it was not possible to do this in the framework of, of, of a, a criminal uh, proceeding. What about the victims? That, that's a very important, um, very difficult question because we are dealing with, with these mega crimes with huge amounts of victims, thousands of victims, but also thousands of participators. It's a group of uh, accused on the one side of actors, you can't commit genocide on your own, but it's also an, an enormous amount of victims. And how do you do justice to these victims? Um, in the ICTY, there was nothing um, special for the victims in the sense that they were not parties to the proceedings and they could not get compensation. Um, and this was considered to be a very weak spot in the overall architecture of the court. 
This has been uh, changed in the International Criminal Court, the ICC. Victims uh, can uh, participate in the proceedings and they can re uh, receive compensations at the end. I will not go into this because this is one of my dadas, something that um, I've written on and, and spoken on also in, in, in um, videotaped lectures. Um, it's a very difficult problem and I'm not so sure that the ICC is doing much better than the ICTY on this perspective. Last point, no peace without justice, no justice without peace. And this really is the whole question about what has been the ultimate contribution of the ICTY to the Balkans. Because what I've been saying now is the importance of the court in general for international criminal justice, but has it done something for the region? And this is really my biggest frustration, uh, my biggest unhappiness if I think back of my work at the ICTY and what it has, has been able to do. Because as we all know, and I, I'm sure Anna is going to go into that probably, um, and there's, there's authors like Milan Milosevic who has written about this very extensively, that in the end, um, the justice that has been rendered by the ICTY has not been accepted in the Balkans. And the different ethnicities within the Balkans have a very different perception of um, what the ICTY has done. They often have the feeling that when they were on the victim side, that the ICTY was not, um, not severe enough. I had my own experience with the, the Ofchara case, the um, Milksic case, where we rendered a, a judgment. And the Croats were furious with the judges because we had not convicted, um, entered a conviction for genocide, which was ridiculous because genocide wasn't even charged. So, yeah, the different ethnicities have um, certainly, most of them don't accept the jurisprudence lock, stock and barrel. As you know, um, Srebrenica is uh, still not recognized um, as genocide by the Serbs. They recognize the facts, but not the legal characterization of the facts. So this is really something that um, I don't think is a real success. And um, what could be done, I have really no clue because the ICTY has tried to work um, um, for to, 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 to reach out to the region, to, to communicate with the, the local uh, populations, but that is something that was not um, a real success. Let me end by just referring to what had Hannah Arendt said. Hannah Arendt's conclusion at the end of the Eichmann tribunal was that um, in fact, a, a court cannot do more than to look at the evidence and to, to assess the facts and to at least sort out um, what had, has been committed in terms of criminal guilt of those people who are be being brought by justice. This is what the Eichmann trial did. This is what the ICTY has been trying to do. And here, I don't know, those who study human rights perhaps know this person. This is Judge Tom Burgenthal. Tom Burgenthal was a judge at the uh, ICJ. Um, and here you see him as an uh, uh, 11 year old child. He was one of the survivors of Auschwitz. So he spent his youth uh, in the concentration camp. His father was killed there. So he really um, is, is a victim of the war who has lived through then these years of uh, modern international criminal justice. And what he says is that uh, he is of the view that Nuremberg was a very important exercise, but it was not enough. And what he feels is that in addition to a criminal trial, which is limited by all these limitations that I just mentioned to you, um, in addition to that, there should be a truth and reconciliation commission that would um, paint the more general historical picture and give more wider perspectives on um, what um, the conflict was about and how possibly conflicts of the kind can be avoided in the future. So this is the end of my talk. Now I'm going to stop share and I can see you again. I hope I've been, I've been too long, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's fine. It's a very interesting presentation. If anyone already has any questions, uh, please put them in the chat uh, and we will deal with them uh, later on. But first, um, I suggest we switch to uh, Dr. Um, Milosevic. Uh, the floor is yours. 
Uh, let me unmute first. Okay, so, well, thank you very much. And thank you also for this wonderful presentation of your work and engagement with ICTY. It was so instructive for me as well. Um, so I want to pick up on some of the, the questions that you have raised um, at the end of your presentation. So I'm going to start from those actually questions and structure my, my today's talk uh, around that. So um, what I would uh, like to begin with is actually to have this kind of like a bird view perspective on where the ICTY actually fits in, you know, like in dealing with the crimes after the uh, after a conflict. So what does it actually mean to deal with the past? And this is something that I have been researching, not only in the in the case of the Balkans, but more generally, to understand better. Um, in what ways we are actually dealing with the past, what does that actually mean for the victims? And in the case of Serbia and Croatia, which are the cases that I examined really in depth, um, I have been looking at these processes um, within the context of European integration. So as you all probably know, um, ICTY dealing with the past through the tribunal was actually one of the, for, uh, of the uh, formal requirements uh, for the EU accession of the countries uh, of the Western Balkans. So we had really clearly, um, um, let's say, um, clearly uh, understood and clearly said that the countries of the Western Balkans should deal with the past and that that dealing with the past should come through their collaboration with the ICTY. So if they wanna join the European family of nations, what they have to do at the beginning, uh, after the the post -conf uh, after the, the the conflict, they would need to um, accept, and they would need to engage with the ICTY, and in this way, by collaborating with the ICTY, they would contribute to reconciliation, dealing with the past, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this was the formal, uh, let's say, requirement of the EU accession process that have explicitly um, uh, referred to dealing with the past. Uh, of the conflict in the 1990s in the region. And on the other hand, what I have been looking at um, is uh, how these processes uh, were um, furthered uh, within the process of European integration, but in a more soft, let's say, form. So um, as you actually mentioned, Matt, uh, Tamara and I, we did um, uh, a book on Europeanization and its effects. So this is the book, Europeanization and Memory Politics in the Western Balkans, where we have a look at all these kind of ways in which the countries of the Western Balkans have dealt with the past as a part, let's say, of the um, soft requirement of the European Union for these countries uh, to engage with the crimes of the 1990s, the ways they are um, contributing to reconciliation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what was actually the influence of these kind of, let's say, formal requirements to deal with the past through ICTY? What was the, you know, like the, the, the concrete impact of these initiatives and these processes, the truth and justice seeking that has been done over many, many years? What has been this kind of impact on the countries of the Western Balkans? So our book and the, the uh, contributors in our book are quite skeptical um, about the uh, positive, let's say, um, impact of ICTY on creating a joint narrative of what had happened in the region. And what I mean by this, um, I mean that we have seen that every country in the Western Balkans has these kind of ethnically confined memory cultures. And these et ethnically confined memory cultures, memory politics as well, um, they're in a, in a certain sense resilient to what have been um, the, the findings of the ICTY. And they're resilient to Europeanization as well. And what I mean by this, I mean in a really, maybe I can give a really concrete example, um, as the professor said before, uh, the one of Srebrenica. When you had the formal requirement of the European Union for Serbia to deal with the events and responsibility for the events in Srebrenica in 1995, and then you have a judgment, you have a process, you have clearly a, a clear path between, you know, like finding the evidence, going through the process, juridical process, and um, uh, condemning the, the, the perpetrators, the, the persons who are responsible. 
And what happens afterwards is that these processes uh, have never overspilled into national parliaments and have never overspilled in, in um, societies as well. So if one of the secondary objectives of the ICTY, which I think it was the secondary objective to um, promote a reconciliation, um, was to kind of, you know, like uh, provide the facts, have a judgment and then uh, uh, wait and see what will happen in the society. This overall objective of, you know, like um, promoting reconciliation has not been really fruitful in the region because as we know in Serbia, there was never a concrete resolution or a, a certain kind of a document that would condemn the events in Srebrenica in the same way that the ICTY um, uh, has depicted it, or in a certain sense as the European Parliament as well has um, uh, portrayed it in a number of resolutions that have been adopted um, uh, in Brussels uh, on this very, very same topic. So on the one hand side, we have this kind of a formal requirement that was to uh, participate in the processes in ICTY. I'm, I'm talking about uh, potential member states. And on the other hand, the European Union, as well as a part of this broader process of dealing with the past and promoting reconciliation, they also try to do something um, in a sense of uh, creating soft kind of laws and soft kind of pressure on these countries to kind of push them into dealing with the past and push them into collaborating more with ICTY. And we have seen this, you know, in the case of Croatia, for instance, when Croatia was reluctant to um, accept the decisions of the ICTY uh, deliver uh, alleged war criminals to, to, to The Hague, we have seen that the European Union also intervened and how do you intervene? They block the process of the EU accession for Croatia. So this has already happened. So the European Union has already tried to support this, you know, broader processes and support also the work of the ICTY because it was important um, uh, at the time to have this kind of truth and justice seeking um, um, uh, process uh, for the region. But as Professor also said, and I think this is really, really an important uh, point, um, uh, the one of political uh, willingness. So how politically are willingful um, the countries or the actors themselves in the region to uh, work with the ICTY? How, are um, uh, how much they are willingful actually to accommodate those you know, facts that were um, presented in ICTY? Um, those kind of uh, judgments that were made by the ICTY. And we have seen that this was actually not the case. And then in many cases, we have seen um, the candidate countries or the countries that want to join the European Union just simply refuting um, the findings um, of the ICTY. So the big question here is whether, you know, like the political willingness is something that is related to an objective to achieve. And in many cases in countries such as Croatia, we could have uh, seen actually that, you know, the, the objective of joining the European Union was more stronger actually than inducing some kind of, you know, regional reconciliation or um, uh, engaging in, in initiatives maybe with um, other countries that will go in that direction. So what we have seen, you know, once the country have joined the European Union was actually this process of backsliding and reappropriating, you know, what was the, the, the narrative, the official narrative before the judgment of the ICTY. So uh, this was quite, I think, clear um, in the case of uh, Ante Gotovina, who was um, um, in ICTY um, uh, um, as, a, as, a, as a war criminal and then liberated and then sent back to Croatia. So there was this, you know, like kind of the perceived on a societal level, perceived kind of pressure that came from the European Union, that came from the international community, um, um, this pressure uh, on Croatia to deal actually with the past, but that was actually refuted on a societal level. 
So when the person went to The Hague and then he came back to The Hague, um, this process also got really, really, really complicated because it also put in the, um, put a qu big question mark, you know, on who is actually the, 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 the victim and who actually is the perpetrator and where this process of, you know, uh, reconciling and dealing with the past, past is actually heading in the Western Balkans. And this, I think, remains um, uh, one of the main questions um, still, you know, 26, 26 years uh, after Srebrenica, uh, you would still find people in Serbia that would dispute the findings of um, ICTY. And this brings us also to the, to the really, I think, important question that I would like to um, talk about later, maybe with the audience, whether reconciliation is conceived simply as a political kind of process, political kind of project that goes from the top level and you know, or whether reconciliation is actually something that we we should observe and actually practice as something as um, that comes from society and civil society and citizens um, themselves. Um, what were actually the effects for the victims, and what were the effects for survivors and family members of those who have perished in the Yugoslav wars? Um, uh, what were the effects uh, of the ICTY for them? So uh, I also could not, I can also not engage with this, um, this question quite particularly because as professor said, that was not actually um, uh, the, the, the main, let's say, um, they were not actually the main actor in these processes in um, ICTY, but looking at um, the initiatives that have been done in terms of dealing with the past in the region, uh, one can also argue that most of the initiatives that targeted in a certain sense, targeted uh, victims, family members of survivors or, or victims themselves were mainly symbolical. So they were um, initiatives that were um, used or created or organized with an intent to support or underpin uh, other political objectives in which the, the victims themselves, they were not they were not central stage. What I mean by this, I mean that, for instance, if we take the example of Srebrenica, which is the one that is really close to my heart, and I have examined it quite quite deeply, um, you, we can see, you know, that you know how the countries themselves have responded to uh, the former requirements, the in, uh, indictments, uh, how the countries have responded um, also to the political pressure. Uh, to recognize the events in Srebrenica as genocide. And then we also have to look at these societal kind of processes that I was talking about. So what has actually happened on the ground? What has actually happened in Serbia and how many people do actually commemorate this event? But what also um, has been done for the, uh, the victims and survivors themselves in Bosnia? So uh, looking at these processes uh, over time, uh, you would see that political actors, those who um, uh, were, let's say, uh, obliged um, to collaborate with the um, ICTY, I'm talking about Serbia, uh, those kind of actors did, um, <clears throat> did that, they engaged with the ICTY, and they engage with the, um, the, the, the process of dealing with the past through the tribunal only because it was something they needed to do. And they did minimal uh, possible effort in, in that sense, um, only to just have a tick on the EU membership, um, uh, membership agenda uh, they were creating in the time. And nothing actually has been done for the victims and survivors themselves. And this was really visible um, in memory politics that Serbia has adopted, uh, especially in regards to Srebrenica. And then in the first years, you would see that um, the president of uh, Serbia would go there and would enact this kind of symbolic memory politics going jointly to the commemoration with other political leaders and ex ex um, expressing his um, his, uh, let's say, condolences uh, for the victims' uh, victims' families, and enacting this kind of symbolism that is quite resonant on the European level. Because um, what is important to understand here is that the process of European integration um, has um, has been really closely monitored in respect to the dealing with the past. 
and the countries uh, are closely monitored and the European progress, uh, the EU progress reports are made every year to assess this kind of dealing with the past and reconciliation, which are considered not as, you know, formal requirements, but as a kind of like a soft requirements for the countries to join the European Union. So there is this, this kind of like a, a, a big uh, narrative of the European Union as a guarantor of peace, uh, promoter of human rights, defender of human rights, uh, with the guarantees of non-reoccurrence of what has happened after the Second World War. And then um, you have the countries that have to emulate this kind of, uh, this kind of a model and these kind of values. I don't like using the term values, but I will, I will in this case. So in this sense, this kind of soft requirement um, of the European Union um, was to uh, for was for countries to deal with the past, to do some kind of reconciliation, provide this kind of symbolic acts of, you know, like being in good faith and and working towards a common goal. And how this manifested manifested in you know in joint participation in commemorations, um, as I say, um, that kind of um, had really short short-term effect because nothing has actually been done um, on that uh, on that um, particular point in Serbia itself. So a president would go, will attend the joint commemoration and the thing will practically end there. And then you will have people who are still um, negating genocide in, in, in Srebrenica, in, in Serbian, Serbian parliament, completely re refusing um, the facts by the, by the ICT, ICTY. <clears throat> so, um, I want to just um, make a few comments maybe um, on the uh, what was the ultimate contribution of the ICTY and then I think we can discuss discuss many of these things um, later in Q&A's. Um, uh, so what was the ultimate contribution? So I, I completely agree what the professor has said uh, from her personal experience um, uh, on, on the topic. Um, and it was quite interesting, I think, to uh, that she used the word rejection of justice or something, something in, in, in this sense, that the people actually um, rejected the justice. Um, I think that on political level, that might be true, um, in a sense that this ties with what has been said on political willingness. And I think, I believe strongly that um, there is really a, a, a huge difference between political type of reconciliation and reconciliation that comes on societal level. So in the political sense of reconciliation, we have seen these number of initiatives. You can see in the ICTY, we have talked many, many, many hours about how the countries are um, uh, co collaborating or being uh, reluctant to collaborate with the ICTY. But what is, I think, the most important uh, in, this, um, in this process was actually how societies responded. And I think that the ICTY had actually an important role in that process of societal uh, reconciliation, and especially in awareness raising on what were the events in the 1990s uh, in particular, I think in, in Serbia, and I think with um, the with the ICTY, we have seen thanks to the ICTY, we have seen uh, a number of initiatives that came from civil society actors that um, contributed in many many ways uh, to reconciliation or at least societal reconciliation um, in the region. Uh, <clears throat> what still remains quite problematic is this um, political ownership of historical narratives in the region. As I said at the beginning, there is this, this um, discordia. So what I mean by this, I mean that every um, country has its own historical narrative that has been strongly of the 1990s that has been strongly embedded in the, in the memory politics um, of the country. So every country, every either member state of the European Union, here I mean uh, Slovenia and Croatia or other countries that are trying to join the European Union, every country in the region of the, 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 the Western Balkans, they have this monopoly uh, over history. And I think that that monopoly um, uh, has not been challenged enough by the, by the, by the ICTY, but 
that of course wasn't the the, the objective uh, of the tribunal in itself. And what we have seen as well that uh, apart from this, you know, the ownership of historical narratives, um, what is really uh, still striking uh, after so many years after the war is that we have seen this um, competition in victimhood that is really persistent. It's really persistent because it ties also not, not only with the events and historical narratives from the 1990s, but also with the Second World War and recently uh, about um, the First World War as well. And this competition in, in, in vict victimhood is something that has been discussed widely in the literature and, and among practitioners um, as well, especially uh, when we are talking about the uh, um, post-accession, post-accession effects um, on memory, memory politics, where we have seen that countries, when they're trying to become the members of the uh, European Union, they're trying to adapt to what are the, the joint stances of the Union on a certain topic, on certain historical narratives. And after that, we, we see this um, huge backsliding, not only in their respect for um, uh, ethnic minorities, but also in what were previously conveyed uh, values and ideals that, um, that relate to, um, to the, process, to the, to the uh, events in the, in the 1990s. So um, I think I'm going to stop here uh, because much, has, much can be said about the Europeanized memory politics in, in, in the Balkans, about the ways that the ICTY or the EU itself, or the process of Europeanization, have affected memory politics and affected reconciliation. Um, my personal take is that um, not much has been um, has been done um, on, on on societal level, and much of this has to do act exactly with the political uh, willingness of um, actors um, in the region. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Milosevic. Um, we'll now have an opportunity to kind of talk about each other's presentations, but I would like to maybe summarize a bit. I mean, we've heard from um, both uh, Professor uh, Van de Weingarten and uh, uh, Dr. Milosevic, that the, the difficulty might lay in the fact that mm -hmm. um, there, there might be a decision by an international body, but to accept um, the decision or the version of facts that is brought out by, by, by the court, um, there's a difficulty both by the limited buy-in of, um, of the societies in which um, the court is, is operating, and also the fact that the, the camps that were at war um, are still to some extent active in the politics today, which allows to re recap or to, to reuse or instrumentalize the decisions that come out of the, uh, have come out of the Yugoslav tribunal. I would like to ask maybe to both of you in, in to what extent you believe that uh, this dynamic is something that is specific to the Yugoslavia context or um, both of you have also studied and worked in, um, in other contexts, um, whether you see the same thing happening in um, memorialization or reconciliation in, in other parts of the world. Who goes first? Anna, you go first? No, please. Well, um, comparing with the ICC, there's nothing I can compare with because the situations are so different. So there's nothing that helps me out there. Um, I don't know Cambodia well enough to see what the impact of the ECCC was. But let me tell you something about my, my own experience. Um, and my question about the Balkans, is there anything particular, Anna, in the psychology of the people in the Balkans? And let me explain this to you. Um, in the early 1990s, when the conflict started escalating, um, I then, I was not a judge yet, I was the Erasmus coordinator at my university in Antwerp. Yeah. And I was, um, I had many friends in the Balkans. We were meeting at a conference in Syracuse two times a year. We were drinking and singing and doing all sorts of nice things. And there were Serbs and Croats and Bosnians. And they were so, such good friends. So when this war, war now, um, breaks out or, or starts to, to, I just think, well, my friends, the intellectuals at the universities, they must be able to stop these, these 
students. I always thought that Erasmus would, would really have stopped any student going to war against students of other European countries. And I couldn't believe it, Anna. My, my colleagues, um, Jelko Horbatic from, from Zagreb, and, and they had become enemies. In such a short time, they were all going back 800 years to Kosovo Polje or whatever other uh, historical wrong. And you know, as from that moment, I took my own Erasmus students in Antwerp to the town hall in Antwerp, where there's a big <clears throat> commemorative, a memory uh, of the Spanish war yeah. and of the Spanish fury, where in some, also 800 years ago, the Spaniards killed uh, thousands of civilians in Antwerp. There's nobody in Antwerp who would remember that or, or even have a grudge for what happened 800 years ago. But my, my, my Yugoslav friends, they were still remembering and still having these, these grudges uh, of feelings that were so, so far away in, in the history. So is it the Balkans? Is there something special about you? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I, I, I cannot uh, talk from the uh, psychological point of view, um, certainly not in the name of, you know, like millions of people in the region. But uh, what I can say, what I think about, you know, like why it's this kind of um, his competition in victimhood, maybe it's so pers persistent, is that actually, mm, as you say, grudges, or let's say, I would say like uh, memory, or um, difficult memories um, uh, from the past, they're a quite important tool because they are a dimension of power. So um, many historians have said in the past that you know who, who holds the the, 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 um, the the past actually holds the power. So it is kind of true because there was there is no regionally um, there is no regional consensus on, on what were the causes uh, of the Yugoslav war. And there are certainly no uh, consensus, there is certainly no consensus of what were the consequences. Mm -hmm. So everybody has its own version of history. And if you have like different kind of versions of one say object, let's say like this band. So if you like look at it from different kind of angles, you would see some something different. And this is where I thought when I started my PhD that, you know, like that Europeanization process can help us to have like a similar point of view on a certain, certain topic, especially in historical narratives. And this is the core, I think, this is the main idea be, behind the Europeanized memory politics is that we have we have different past, but we can agree on main points. So we can agree that you know who is the perpetrator, um, who is the victim. We can agree that you know human rights should be respected. We can agree on on a certain number of you know like minimum common denominators, and we can through those we can examine you know our past. We can examine also our actions. But what I have seen after writing this book and after writing my PhD thesis. Uh, is actually that um, the Europeanization itself, uh, especially Europeanization of memory politics has really, really um, uh, limited, uh, let's say effects um, on this kind of monopoly that the nation states um, actually have. But as you said, like it is quite, uh, quite um, strange um, to see that, you know, 26 years uh, or almost 30 years, 30 years exactly, um, uh, since the war started um, in, in, in former Yugoslavia, that people still cannot agree to disagree. That's not even possible, uh, I think, for many, many people. And on the one hand side, you have uh, what is, you know, like memory itself, the definition of memory, what is collective memory? On the one hand, it is based on personal experiences. So for some of these people, um, uh, they have personal recollections of the events that is really um, hard to override or give them um, different kind of meaning because it's it touches you deeply. And for many other, especially for younger generations, uh, you would have collective memory understood as a knowledge about the past. So what is this knowledge of the past that they have? It's what they have been freed with, with you know, like over the, the decades. And that, you know, that, you know, that, that bread that was given to them, like the, 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 the history that was um, given to them was actually the one of the, uh, um, the nation state, the ethnic nation state, the, 
um, uh, the, the narrative um, that is actually not shared by you know no one out of the country. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, that's a very interesting insight. Um, Perhaps also from from a judge's pers perspective, um, um, Professor van der Weingart, looking back um, and and having this this breadth of experience already in uh, in dealing with these issues, you talked about uh, the possibility of um, also having, uh, in addition to uh, international criminal courts, uh, truth and reconciliation commissions as perhaps a more appropriate or suitable way for uh, achieving reconciliation. Do you think that the, the task of a judge or um, when, when actually issuing, when drafting opinions, when thinking about how to deliver justice practically, that judges should be thinking about the way in which their judgments will be perceived by um, the, the context in, in which they will be handed out? Or do you think that the duty of objectivity or, or, or strict uh, legal interpretation uh, would would prevent uh, judges from doing that or should prevent judges from doing that? Well, my answer would be the latter. I think um, the judges have to stick to the facts to see whether the facts have been established and then to concentrate on how to <laughs> legally characterize these facts. Because here you can also have this, this um, well, competition of narratives and, and uh, conquering victimhood. As, and I was saying, some, somebody used the term, the Olympics of genocide. Uh, all the victims uh, Victim want to have their, their, um, their case be called genocide, but, but not all mass murders are genocide. And, and maybe, maybe it's not such a good idea to have genocide at all. I know I am now saying something terrible, but maybe this is too much an emotional term. Maybe we should get rid of, of, of two emotional terms. Also, the term terrorism, I think, is in, in, in the this, this same category. And because Serbia, they don't really deny the facts in Srebrenica. They, they accept it. I don't think that they can deny it. But they deny it is genocide. The same with, with the Turks about um, the, the genocide uh, of um, the Armenians. They, they, they recognize perhaps that something happened there. They may not recognize the magnitude, but they certainly won't recognize that it's genocide. So maybe this, this legal labeling has been going a bit too far and has perhaps reached the opposite result of what it, it wanted to achieve. Do you have a comment to that, uh, Dr. Milosevic? I saw you were yeah, frowning. <laughs> because actually, when I, when I was um, working on this topic for my PhD uh, many years ago, so I was speaking with practitioners that actually, you know, deal with these questions, you know, dealing with the past and reconciliation and ICTY, and they deal with these questions regionally. And some of these initiatives are transnational. Uh, they are not just like based in, in one country. And they actually... Um, told me that they actually use that term, the victims Olympics. Yeah. So who among the countries has the most victims, who has suffered more? So there is actually this term, the victims Olympics that I find really, really, really interesting. And, um, and yes, um, uh, the, the reconciliation part, I think is the, the hardest one. And um, somehow, when I looked at the processes of reconciliation from the point of view of the European Union, how the European Union actually understands reconciliation. So I was quite convinced and I was also told by some of the political actors that are involved in the process that how they understand actually reconciliation for the Balkans, but also in other, other kind of regions, it kind of ties, ties to the, you know, the Franco-German reconciliation so once um, I think it was um, a German member of the parliament, uh, Doris Pack, who was quite active um, uh, in, in, in within, the, uh, within the region and especially on dealing with the past. She once told me, you know, like if France and Germany can do it, like they can do it, like everybody can do it, like um, in, using the, 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 same, the same kind of template. So what, you know, like the European politicians, um, what they uh, talk about when they talk about reconciliation is actually this kind of template that they have in mind, the, the one of the Franco-German reconciliation. You can see this, you know, in the number of initiatives that European Union has promoted in the region. Uh, whether we are talking about, uh, I don't know, the joint history books, 
So they have invested millions and they have invested um, uh, so much money and time into making those books uh, um, in the region that would kind of tell this kind of multifocal history from different kind of angles to kind of break this monopoly that the countries have over the past. But at the end, what happens on the ground? That's always, you know, you have a policy and then you have the implementation problem. So what happens at the end? It happens that the countries, they do not use these kind of um, uh, books to teach kids uh, history. So of course, every country has its own history books. And it depends from the teacher, whether the teacher is actually willing, an individual, whether he or she is willing actually to use these kind of alternative materials and what kind of um, version of history he or she wants to, wants to present to the students. But this is just one of the examples, you know, like you see in museums, you see the, the efforts to Europeanize museums to provide this kind of multifocal view on the history. Um, it's, it is quite, di quite difficult to break the, mo the monopoly over history, not only in the Balkans, but if you look at elsewhere as well. In many countries, it's impossible to kind of challenge what are like widely accepted historical narratives. We, we know uh, all about it here in Belgium as well. It is, you know, it is really hard to talk about colonialism and, you know, many, many decades have gone, you know, since, you know, this debate actually first started in the public space and we are still there and we are still debating mm -hmm. and we are still having, you know, the committees mm -hmm. and it's only starting now after so many decades. And in the Balkans, we have to acknowledge that, you know, the process of dealing with the past and transitional justice and ICTY and everything, it was instant, it was immediate. And, and so um, in real I mean, time. Yeah. And you, you really highlight an important point. I think uh, we, we have talked about political will already, but societal will and the responsibility of everyone in society to contribute uh, to, the, um, to the process might also be interesting. Um, we, in your book, or at, re at least I, I read the introduction of, of your book, um, and you speak about the EU memory framework, um, mm -hmm. uh, which, um, if I understood correctly, is a, a series of resolutions um, and uh, memorials that the EU uh, is, is trying to, as you put it, um, softly impose or, or uh, at least influence uh, or, or ask um, Western Balkan countries to accept. So you know, a list of resolutions on, on everything from the Armenian genocide to, mm -hmm. um, to the, the remembrance of totalitarianism. Uh, but that seems to me um, to be a very top-down approach. Um, it's it's almost asking, you know, by diktat as a as a as an accession a condition to rewrite or to rethink uh, the history of the country that 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 is uh, applying for for EU accession. And I was wondering whether, in the same way. Um, um, whether you could think the same way about about international criminal courts and the judgments they hand down, especially um, on the one hand, there's the paradox that if the court is is uh, seated in in the Hague, as you have put it, uh, Professor van der Weinhardt, it it facilitates having a more objective view to the situation, but at the same time. You are far removed from from the people who are actually the the subject of of um, of, of, of the legal findings. So uh, my question would be then: is is would it be better to have uh, the courts on a more local level to to allow the civil society uh, or the individuals in society to have more of a say or more of a, a feel of, of buy-in into these decisions for, for reconciliation? Do you think that is a more uh, appropriate approach? Well, this has been, been done in Cambodia. In Cambodia, the court is uh, in Phnom Penh and it's a mixed court. So you have um, international judges and, and, and local judges. Um, doesn't seem to work very well because there's a lot of conflicts between, between these judges. Um, the ICC, in theory, can sit in the region. Um, so we've tried that in our first case, in the Lubanga case, there was a proposal to organize a trial there, but that then wasn't done mm -hmm. because of security concerns. We've tried it in Kenya as well, that again was not done because of security concerns. Mm -hmm. And you may know Charles Taylor, and that, that the trial um, of uh, the, the president of uh, Sierra Leone, of, no, of, of Liberia, uh, was not done in Sierra Leone, where the trial was set, but it was done in The Hague also for security reasons. 
it's a very different type of, 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 of trials where you really <laughs> also need to, to protect your witnesses. And that's really a, a very, very difficult thing to do. And so, yeah, um, it's very, imagine an inter, a jury trial, an international jury trial. How would you, you select your, your jury members? How could they be totally unbiased, unattached to, to the region? It's, it's, it's a philosophical question. It, it's um, very difficult to give a general answer to that. And so maybe the TRC formula is, is from that perspective easier because you can have a, have a much more mixed um, um, organ or commission that looks in, into conflicts. Yeah. yeah, but if I may add uh, also, you know, concretely on the, the Western Balkan countries. So you have this kind of, you know, on the one hand you have transitional justice, okay, which is quite clear what it does in the region after a conflict. And then this transitional, transitional justice was embedded in the overall process of European integration, you know, Europeanization of the country. So what, you know, Europeanization process actually entailed in the region was also this kind of democratization and, you know, fostering the rule of law. So after a while, after a while, there was this kind of, you know, the overspill between the ICTY and the national, um, national courts. So there, was a, there is a special court, for instance, in, in Serbia, uh, that deals with uh, these crimes. And some of the competences, I think the judge will know better, some of the competences um, that ICTY actually had were transferred to the national courts because when they were deemed, uh, let's say mature enough, or you know, like to have reached this kind of level that they can deal with these crimes uh, by themselves, they were also uh, making judgments on um, on the crimes that were committed in their own country or by their own nationals. It's true, but apparently in Bosnia it doesn't work or it works very badly. Mm -hmm. yeah, you still see the daily press reports coming from the region and um, there's not much optimism there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and perhaps um, uh, a question to, to Dr. Um, uh, Milosevic, uh, the, the fact that maybe the courts themselves have been memorialized in a way as as being part of the whole story of the war does that does that complicate things in themselves as well um or the alternative of course would be to have a completely external actor in some way i don't i don't know if that it would be even even possible but the, the fact that the courts themselves have also this this value of, of, of thinking about you know be, being part of the memory of the war of the Yugoslav wars this, would that complicate things in the sense that the, the institute of the court themselves is something that could be fought about uh, in the memory wars let's say I'm not sure exactly how to go on with the answer uh, to your question but um, I think that, you know, like the, the tribunal, um, actually, I think they, they were like initially, I think, um, they had a lot of wishful thinking about, you know, the things, you know, the objectives they want to achieve, there was this kind of enthusiasm. Um, but at the end, you know, like wishful thinking, it was bashed, bashed, I think, by the by the reality of the events, and the judge will know more uh, about this because I don't think it was an easy process for the people who who uh, were involved in this um, in these uh, proceedings uh, in um, in ICTY. But I also don't think that it was, um, you know, actually their job to engage with the question of reconciliation. I think they were more focused on, you know, like actual cases that they had in front of them. Yes, and it's very important for a judge to do that. And you have to be empathic towards the victims, but it should not affect your way of judicial reasoning. And you should not, so some judges with whom I disagree, um, go for a teleological interpretation of the law. Whereas the criminal law is of a narrow, strict interpretation, should not be applied by analogy. And it's not because there are numerous victims that that changes you really should stick to the law uh, as it is because otherwise you are going to to go over a threshold that puts then the fairness of the trial into doubt and if the trials are not fair who is going to to accept the jurisprudence 
Professor, we have a question from the audience, uh, more of a, a practical question about whether there ever has been any concrete um, compensation for any victims um, by, by the court. Not by the ICTY because it's not in their, um, their jurisdiction. They just can't do it. It has not been foreseen. At the ICC, this is not happening. And um, huge amounts of, of um, money are, go are being given to the victims, at least on paper, but the whole question is, will they get it and, and who will pay for it? Because one of the things is, if you look at it from the perspective uh, of the analogy with the domestic trial, then you would have a situation where someone is convicted and he would then pay um, the compensation to the victims. But at the, in the international courts, either your accused has no money, is indigent, or your accused is very rich, but at the end of the trial, which can last years, can last 10 years, at the end of the trial, uh, he has uh, spent all his money on lawyers. And this was hap happened to um, Charles Taylor, who was very rich with his diamonds in Sierra Leone, um, who in the beginning could pay for five star advocates. In the end, at the end of his trial, he was on legal aid because he had no money left. So it, it's all, it's very, very difficult to organize all these things. And in the ICC, we will see, because um, there's now, there has been decisions last week in the Antaganda case, <laughs> to award millions of, um, of euros to the victims. But of course, it's not the accused who can pay for it. So it's going to be, well, again, I suppose, mainly European states who are going to, to pay through the fund for, for victims. And then you get into another story because if you are going to give so many euros to victims of a particular situation in the Congo, what are you going to give to the victims in, say, uh, Afghanistan or um, Palestine, perhaps, if that, that case goes through uh, before the court? So mm -hmm. it, it's very, very difficult. And you have spoken about the, the duty of, of judges to apply the law, at least criminal law, uh, very strictly. Perhaps uh, um, a part of the process where there is more discretion is in the um, in the decisions made by the prosecutor to go after certain um, crimes and certain um, and, and leave other crimes out of the, the scope of, of, of certain investigations. You have been um, critical of some decisions uh, by the by the prosecutor at the ICC. Um, what do you think is the right way to for a, for a prosecutor to approach um, uh, conflicts like these where um, often you will have to make a decision not to prosecute something. Um, should that only be on the basis of not having enough evidence or should the prosecutor be able, uh, in contrast maybe to the judges, to direct mm, the prosecutorial decisions in a way that would maybe foster um, a better outcome in terms of uh, reconciliation? Well, that's a, a very um, important question. Um, and of, of course, the, 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 the position of the prosecutor in, in an international court is the most difficult one because they have to decide on a certain policy to follow. And um, at the ICTY, it was clear that there was a, a, an attempt to be even handed to, 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 to prosecute um, people from, from all sides in the conflict and to, to concentrate on the higher responsible. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps there they have not been, been very successful all the time because only Milosevic has been indicted, not uh, Tuchman and not Izetbegovic. From that perspective too, you can um, wonder whether things could have been different. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think it's, it's the role of the prosecutor really to be um, engaged in reconciliation or to have that in the back of his mind. I think, well, the main function of a criminal trial is to be a criminal trial, to collect the evidence of crime that have been committed and on the basis of the evidence, indict the persons that you can indict. And of course, it's very difficult to indict the higher ups. It's very easy to indict the perpetrators because they, they, they have committed the crimes with their hands. It's much more easy to, to, to prove that. And that's yeah. one of the main challenges of, of these international tribunals to go for the higher responsible. Yeah. I don't know whether that answers your question, but I don't think there, there is a good answer to your question. It's a very difficult, um, difficult um, part of the job. Yeah. 
perhaps let's then ask how, how, how we should or how we could improve actually the, the reconciliation process. Uh, Dr. Milosevic, would you have, let's say you are in charge of, of designing the, the, the way in which reconciliation should, should go from here. We, we already spoke about truth and reconciliation commissions. We have the experience of international <laughs> criminal courts and we know about certain um, spontaneous bottom-up initiatives that, that happen. What do you see as, as a way forward in um, laying to rest the, the um, inheritance of, of the Balkan Wars? What, what should politicians yeah. and, and societies be looking at in terms of you know, concrete ways to get out or, or to, to finally uh, make peace? Um? Well, uh, first of all, <laughs> I wanna say that, you know, um, why I'm so critical about all of this, because I think that, you know, too much emphasis since the very beginning has been put on reconciliation. And political reconciliation is something separate from societal reconciliation. So after a major conflict, you cannot push people into having this kind of talks um, uh, about reconciliation where the wounds are still fresh. So it's really, really, really difficult. So. Uh, the problem is that, you know, that we have these kind of certain templates when we think about reconciliation, when we think about how we should deal with the past. So for many practitioners, and I also have to say many judges as well, so the, 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 the template that they have in their mind is the one, not only the Franco-German reconciliation, but the one of the Southern Africa Commission for Truth and Justice. So I think this is wrong, and I have been to South Africa, and I know what I'm talking about. You know, th these processes of, processes of confrontation between the perpetrator and the victim, uh, the how the South Africa has dealt with it, it's a still ongoing process. But they have a common process. narrative. They have a common history. Mm -hmm. They have a common history that is also not not fully acknowledged by everybody and that there are still marginal histories in the, the, in, the, in the whole process. Because when we think about apartheid, we don't think about the people of um, Islamic religion that are also present, present there and they do not fit these black and white categories. So there's still marginal narratives even now in South Africa, I would say. But you know, I think that on the Balkans, there was a lot of pressure um, to uh, put on those countries to deal with the past and it was put like immediately. Of course, it was really important at the moment that the, the conflict ended to, um, uh, to um, uh, find the, 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 the perpetrators to start this process of you know, justice bringing because there were numerous, numerous victims all, all over. Uh, but the, the burden of reconciliation, you have to reconcile, you have to reconcile. Um, it's actually, I think it lost its meaning in the region because now if you talk to, to people um, in the region, especially in the youngsters and you say like, what do you think about reconciliation? Uh, would you as a Croat uh, travel to Serbia? I say, yeah, of course, why not? Just like whatever happened, it happened. So they do not think in these this kind of terms. Uh, now in this moment. And you know, the real reconciliation is something something else, I think on societal level. Um, so I don't know, it's a complicated, it's a complicated question, but what I would do um, actually, um, uh, if I were maybe the, uh, someone who is um, assessing the progress of countries that want to join the European Union, if, if I were in, that you know asymmetrical position of, of power that I could say how they should do it and what should we would be um, what should we be looking at you know as a, as an example of reconciliation I would not look at the the political um, uses of the past and mani manipulation of um, uh, memory politics uh, for instance um, if there are joint commemorations and I know like, uh, I, I have seen this in, in the region that you know, joint commemorations to events in, in the region are usually organized and, uh, and formulated in that way um, as an example of reconciliation, which is, I don't think it's, it's actually the case. There are important examples of this kind of symbolic politics, okay, but it is something that is done uh, usually in a certain point of time with a certain objective uh, in front of the political actors. So we cannot use these um, examples as examples of reconciliation. Symbolic politics, yes. Surely, but whether this kind of symbolic politics actually actually has something to do with the 
with the, the victims, with the survivors, whether this kind of uh, symbolic politics has benefited them in, in any ways. So I'm really doubtful about that. I don't think if you speak with victims of Srebrenica genocide and say, yeah, do you like that Vucic came to Srebrenica a couple of years ago? Um, they would say like, I don't care. I absolutely do not care that he, he came. He came because he wanted to show something to the world. And he didn't came there for us. So because Serbia never actually engaged in any kind of initiatives that would provide this kind of restorative justice or reparations or uh, not at least directly uh, mm -hmm. for the victims and, and survivors. And this is Srebrenica is just only one of the, 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 the cases in the region. You can find many, many in Kosovo and in other, other places. All right. Professor van der Weinkart, do you have anything to add? Or? I don't think there's anything to add, I think, no. Yeah, so the um, so maybe in in um, I mean at, at Nuremberg, but also in 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 South Africa, perhaps the, the crucial factor in um, I mean you could say the success. There will always um, mm -hmm. be other views, but the fact that the 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 person or the the ideology that was at in the docket, let's say, as the accused, was so convincingly defeated in public imagination and the pressure was so uh, large maybe that was what led to the to the acceptance of, of the judgment or the fact that in in um, in uh, Yugoslavia you you still had um, I mean all the um, all the different parties is that is that the real factor that that, that is the difference here or um... but even in Germany it, it took generations before they really accepted Nuremberg. It wasn't said with so many words, but there was this, this huge non-acceptance of, of Nuremberg and this feeling that they were, um, they had been unjustly uh, treated as a, as a people. And that is going away with time. And so maybe this is happening in the Balkans too, that younger generations want to move on with the, the future and want to, to put the past behind them. And so, yes, it, it, it's a, a big question with this axioma that we all have, that impunity um, will have as a result that the conflict lingers on. So that's why we have the fight against impunity, um, because if we don't punish, uh, we won't be able to proceed. But maybe that's the wrong hypothesis. We have to, to dare asking it. It's a difficult, delicate question, and it would go against the common feeling that we have since Nuremberg, that this was a, a good thing. And as I said um, with my, my PowerPoints, that if the Kaiser had been punished uh, after the First World War, then Hitler wouldn't have said what he said about the Armenians, and maybe Hitler wouldn't have invaded Poland. Is, is that something that is not a bit too overly simplistic as, as, a, as a narrative? Also from us, uh, well, uh, academics and historians, maybe we should be critical of our own narrative here. I say I have another. I have a question from the audience. Um, perhaps uh, there is uh, someone who asks um, or comments that in, in Flanders, so so here in Belgium, it took uh, it took about one generation to get to a, a common story about the um, the collaboration past. So the the collaboration between certain uh, Flemish really? political mu movements and the uh, and the German occupiers. Uh, and um, this person asks, are there any examples of reconciliation where it goes uh, much faster? Uh, and, and is there a variable that explains a quicker uh, reconciliation? So this is going again to the, to the same question, uh, basically, uh, mm. what, what makes it go faster in some countries? Perhaps uh, Dr. Milosevic? Well, I would not totally agree that, you know, like in Flanders or in Belgium, we have come to some kind of like consensus on that. Uh, because um, I, I still think that pretty much like when we talk about memory politics in Flanders, the focus is pretty much on the good things. So on the First World War, if I'm right, and not on the Second World War. Um, and if we talk about the examples, I think what are the positive examples of reconciliation? Um, well, um, well, the European Union, I would say it's, um, it's um, an example of, let's say, those kind of, um, those kind of efforts after the Second World War. 
And what is different um, between, if we look at the, um, the, the European Union as an example of reconciliation and how it can be achieved, then we look at the Balkans, we have two completely different examples. Because we have the European Union project as something that you said, like, there was a Second World War, okay, we understood who were the perpetrators. It's quite clear. Everybody agrees on that after the Second World War. But in order to move forward, to um, reconstruct the, the, the continent, we have to put the past away. So the past was in a certain sense uh, put away in order to, 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 to start this kind of unification uh, process um, in, uh, in the continent. And there was this consensus. So I think that was uh, quite important. And there were like clear ideas on how we can achieve cooperation. So cooperation was the key. The regional cooperation was the key, the cooperation between, between France and Germany. And this kind of economic growth, which was the, the number one priority, I think. And then what we uh, observe as, you know, like truly political and societal kind of reckoning with the past that came later. That absolutely came later, and it's a process that took so many decades. And in some regions, um, in some cities, it's still, you know, a vivid memory. But it's not something that you know creates obstacles to living together or having a, a collaborating together. But it was something that has um, has taken time. I think on the European level, at least you know between the the first six members of the European Union. And if we look at the Balkans, actually. We also see this kind of tendency of having this kind of clustering. And what I mean by this, I mean that, you know, there are like the Visegrad group, okay, there is also the Western Balkan six, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And there are a number of different kind of um, groups, informal or former groups that are gathered around the idea, around the policy um, in the Western Balkans that are really important, I think, arenas for discussion and, and exchange among countries. So there's CEFTA, for instance, there was CEFTA. Um, there are a number of other platforms that are, you know, like an opportunity for the states, institutions also to familiarize um, with uh, one with the, uh, with the other and for also for the people to collaborate. And I think that, you know, there's um, all these kind of programs. And yesterday, I think actually ended the Europe for Citizens uh, program uh, after so many years, all these kind of programs that actually enhance um, participation and, and boost this kind of, you know, like exchange people to people. They are, I think, the most important in this regard. Uh, because the political decisions, um, uh, you know, like I've taken on a, on, a, on a high level, but actually what changes you as a person, what makes you think about, you know, this kind of, you know, rapprochement towards the other, uh, knowing the other people, traveling around is, you know, like the experience that you actually have in your life. So um, I think that's quite different. And as the uh, as judge said before, uh, you know, she was remembering when she was, uh, you know, uh, working with Erasmus and everything. So that was an important experience because these kind of experiences enrich, you know, people's existence, I think. And these kind of, you know, experiences can also, I think mainly can boost the reconciliation societally in the region. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, thank you. Um, we, we have another audience question um, and it goes to the, the point, uh, Professor van der Weinhardt, you, you talked about the fact that, um, um, creating or establishing the, the ICTY today would probably not be, be possible given the, the current political situation. And uh, the question asks um, um, that, um, or it comments before Nuremberg that the idea of putting uh, leaders that were uh, responsible for what is now called international crimes uh, on the accused stand, that that seemed revolutionary at the time, uh, but that since then the idea of doing justice has been connected to the image of court proceedings, but that in recent years, the language of, of justice has um, also been used, for example, to issue uh, human rights sanctions, most recently um, with regard to China by the EU. And the person asks, do you welcome this as like a, a broadening of the toolbox to seek uh, accountability, or is it rather a slinking ambition on part of democratic minded states to pursue accountability uh, for violations of international norms before uh, courts? Oh, that's a big question. Yeah. Um, well, to me, human rights 
um, and the criminal law are two sides of, of the same coin. Uh, human rights are the shields. Human rights are protecting individuals against infringements. The, the criminal law is taking it as one step further and, and it's putting indivi individuals to trial for infringements of human rights. And historically, after the First World War, Nuremberg didn't proceed. Nuremberg was dead because there was no political willingness. On the contrary, human rights did proceed, especially in Europe with the European Court of Human Rights. And so I think both, both should go together and, and human rights are perhaps the more um, easy and more potent mechanism because they can use can be used also in economic contexts like economic sanctions and and other ways of pressurizing countries going to making the step to punish people is, is, is going very much beyond that of course and yes it was possible in 19 uh, 93 we were still in this post cold war romance where people thought that that um, the east west um, opposition would go away forever but what we've seen in recent years is, is an opposite um, movement and that's why we, we couldn't have a security council um, agreement to put syria for example before the icc or um, uh, afghanistan so th this is really um, re real politics if, if the, the big states don't follow it will be very difficult to to achieve concrete results in terms of punishment. And so that's why I think that the, the human rights, uh, economic sanctions may be um, for now a more effective tool. That's very clear. Um, an, another question for, um, for Dr. Milosevic, but uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's more political um, in a sense. Um, someone comments that um, uh, there's the argument that the, the Yugoslav wars brought an end to the uh, alliance between nationalists and liberals that brought uh, the end of uh, Soviet domination in, in Central and Eastern Europe, but that this then left um, liberal governments uh, in the region vulnerable to the return of nationalism that we have seen in recent years. And this person asks if you would agree with this analysis that the, the, the return of, of nationalists uh, or, or resurgence in a sense um, is because the, the, the liberal governments um, left that flank uh, open by not including the nationalist um, 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 narrative in their own, um, in their own um, political um, project. That's a really interesting question, but it, I, I totally do not agree. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that, that that actually happened. I would say that in the Western Balkans, but also elsewhere in the world, you know, what was primarily left is central left now. So I don't. I don't think you know that you know like we are free of nationalism, but nationalism definitely is is a disease of our mo modern times, and like now, I think more than ever. Um, so. I must say, I, I, can, I, can, I don't know how to comment that. <laughs> Professor? I, I can confirm that it was for me, when, when listening to these trials and to the witnesses, uh, it was so clear how national, nationalism had been tearing them apart. There were so many of, of these witnesses who were speaking of um, just a couple of years before that, 10 years or five years, going together to cafes, to balls, singing and dancing together. And then in no time they were split up. It's, it's really amazing how, how um, what, what an effect that nationalism can have. Look at the United States. Is, is the MAGA idea also not nationalism? And if you have a fool at the top of your nation, you can do so much damage. And that's what happened in the Balkans. It's Milosevic. You know, Milosevic started it all off with his speech, Kosovo Polje speech, um, um, where he was really igniting the conflict. And that's where he then uh, blew over the whole Balkans and, and, and really teared the country apart. And of course, followed by other head, uh, hot heads like Tuchman, like um, Izet Begovic. These were the people that really caused to me that's the way I, I look at the conflict and it's so dangerous so the real battle is in the political sphere uh, yes, and, uh, yes absolutely yeah um someone else uh, has asked um uh, to uh, professor van der weinhardt uh, someone has read your uh, dissenting opinion in the arrest warrant case 
um, and uh, asks um, well notes that that uh, in, in that case you you criticize your fellow members uh, on the bench for not addressing the issue of universal jurisdiction mm -hmm. uh, and thereby failing to draw a line uh, between accountability on the one hand and the principle of sovereign equality um, and it, it, he, this person asks um, whether you still think uh, the same way about universal jurisdiction, um, uh, whether that would still be a useful tool, let's say, in, uh, for a country to, um, to open its courts to, to complaints um, from all over the world. Right. Well, let, let me say um, that I'm perhaps a bit less enthusiastic about universal jurisdiction than I was at the time. Um, and I think all in the opinion, I also made, made a point that uh, politically, it may perhaps not be always the best idea to exercise universal jurisdiction, but on legal grounds, I still believe what I was saying then, that there was no rule prohibiting states from exercising universal jurisdiction for core crimes, and not, not for all crimes, but for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. But having had now, um, well, 20 years of experience as a judge in the uh, international criminal court world, um, I see, I look at it from a more pragmatic point of view and I can see how difficult it is to bring evidence. Um, it is not impossible because you can have witnesses who are willing uh, to come and testify, but it, it, it is difficult. And the, the more um, ideal solution is of course for um, to have this division of labor that the highest responsible would be tried by an international court and then the lesser responsible mm. by national courts, some of which acting on the basis of universal jurisdiction, which has happened in the Rwanda situation. In the Rwanda situation, the higher ups were prosecuted in Arusha and then lots of lower um, uh, accused in national courts, including in Belgium, in Switzerland, in the Scandinavian countries, and some also in Rwanda. So that's perhaps a better example, although also not ideal. If you look at what is happening in Rwanda nowadays, there is no ideal example, I think. So there's a lot of work to do for you students, for the younger generation. It's your responsibility to now build it further and to, to make it a success and to further think about the lessons that you can learn from the errors that people like myself have made. Oh, thank you. Um, the heavy burden is all ours. Um, <laughs> Uh, another another question on YouTube um, is um, someone asked what about the Serbian uh, soldiers that were active in Kosovo and were responsible for the safe transport of people in Kosovo to the border to escape uh, and uh, uh, that abused their power and did unspeakable things. What about their punishment or what was uh, the thing that that um, shielded them from the persons uh, leading them? Um, I think this person is asking about um, whether um, some Serbian soldiers um, were actually helping uh, people in Kosovo. Um, and uh, also at the same time, noting that a lot of people um, did not get the punishment they received. So maybe we could rephrase this question in the sense of um, what, what should we do or how should we deal with the fact that a lot of crimes will never be um, indicted and uh, will never find resolution in a court? How, how should society or how should we deal with that, um, with that hard fact? Perhaps Dr. Milosevic or, or Professor, if you want to pick it. Yeah, I think that's the, the question that the judge can can respond to because it, it, it deals with uh, the justice, justice bringing, you know, in general. And um, I'm not sure how to go about it because I'm not familiar with that particular case, but there, uh, do not get me wrong, there are so many cases like that and there are so many cases that will, you know, never see the court ever. So I don't know how to respond to that question. Well, I won't even start responding to the concrete question because as a judge now in the Kosovo tribunal, I should not um, take any positions in relation to that part of the Yugoslav uh, conflict. But of course, it, it's, as I was saying earlier, um, these international crimes are mega crimes committed by great numbers of accused against great numbers of victims. And it, it is impossible to do justice from the perspective that you would want to have all those who are guilty punished or all those who are victims compensated. That is, if you want to do that, you better stop because that, that is not going to be possible. So you have to 
you have to pick out and it's, it's always that's then the big question for the prosecutor who are you going to select and what is going to be uh, your prosecution policy um, and it will always be a limited number think of of the nazi um, genocide holocaust machinery thousands of people have been engaged in that and yes just a few hundreds so will have been brought to justice is that the reason for not bringing those people to justice no of course not but um yeah an ideal solution doesn't exist here and then someone asks uh, professor uh, milosevic about um how to how to cultivate a good uh, culture of of memorializing things uh, what 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 would be um the, the person asks um in, in, specifically about uh, freedom of, of uh, education um, about you spoke about education as well mm -hmm. what would be a good general practice as a society uh, to to maybe prevent um, uh, memorials or memories to be instrumentalized in that way is it is it to seize upon it quickly and and um, and immediately bring about a culture of of, of memorizing certain events or uh, how do we do that well, as I said, memory politics is about having the, this dimension of power in it. So that is what is uh, what interests most the people who are like engaging with memorialization in general, whether they are politicians, whether they are states, whether they are uh, some kind of organizations. It's this kind of like you know power that they they, they could invest um, in memorialization and you know some kind of practical kind of um, benefit that they could have from it. So. Of course, you know, like the benefits that you can get by engaging with uh, memorialization can be multiple. You know, if you're a victim, it may give you some kind of, you know, um, way to deal with your, with uh, your own experiences. If you're, a, I don't know, a family member, it can give you a closure. Um, if you're a politician, it can get you votes. So everybody has this kind of different kind of objectives that they can assign to memorialization in general. But I think that um, in terms of, you know, if we speak about memory politics in general, and, you know, we have seen lately that, you know, a number of, you know, memorials and monuments have been contested. So why they're being contested and how can we go about, you know, um, taking this power element, I think from monuments and, you know, memorial places uh, around the world is by actually putting more focus and more consideration into making monuments at the first place. So what I mean by this, I mean that, you know, like I think that, you know, consultations on whether we should have a memorial should be, you know, initiated with the local population. So if I want to make a memorial and I'm a victim of some kind of atrocity or some kind of unfortunate event like the terrorist attack. So if I want to make a monument in my uh, municipality here in Skadbeck, so I would need to have an open consultation with local authorities, with the citizens living in, in, in the city to see whether this actually is needed. Like in the UK, in the UK, there is this really nice law that they have like um, a law that actually 20 years after an event or something has occurred, you cannot have an official monument. So I think 20 years, it's quite okay. Uh, for us to think about whether these monuments should be memorials publicly. And what we have seen in the Balkans and what we have seen, you know, in these places that, you know, have suffered such tremendous atrocities, uh, Rwanda, other places in the world, is that we have memorials coming instantly. Also in South Africa, uh, you would see like going to the townships in, in South Africa that there are memorials that were like just planted there, nobody uses them, but they were used, they were made with the intent to kind of symbolize something, they were imposed to the uh, local uh, societies, the local populations by the politicians as some kind of a totems of um, uh, memory politics. But if the people are not using those memorials, or the people are not, um, cannot identify with themselves with those memorials, why do we need them in the public space at the first, at the first place? Why should we have them? Yes, sir. The only point, Anna, on which I disagree with you, or perhaps yes. not agree totally. You know, traveling in France, when you go into these small villages and you see these these memorials of the, the First World War, the Second World War, how many youngsters at age 18, 19 have, have, have fallen, I have this, this feeling of, well, sympathy. 
that I wouldn't have if those monuments were not there. And sometimes I wonder why in my own country, we don't have these monuments in the villages. Some, some towns have it in Arscot, for example, but... Um, and also there are monuments. I know also quite well, there are monuments, there are monuments, but there are different kind of monuments. Um, but yeah, there are some kind of monuments like this all over, especially, you know, like in Europe, if we look at the Europe, but I'm thinking more about these monuments that you would find like instantly um, after a certain event, certain event, or like when you have like a local association that says like, I want to have a monument for like my own ethnic, religious, sexual kind of group that, you know, we want to, uh, we want to uh, speak about our experiences. I think speaking out is good. Raising awareness is good. But I think also that we as societies, we tend to overuse memorialization. Right. And I think you know, like we have arrived to the point when we have memorials to everything. And I don't think that they actually work and they are not beneficial. Uh, I think they're just like really instant kind of um, um, band-aids, you know, for what are our other kind of uh, political or, you know, personal. Must make sure not to enter into a discussion about wokeness. Uh. I think we have uh, another webinar on that one in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you are interested, <laughs> you're always welcome. Um, I see, unfortunately, that our, our time is it has run out. Um, I, I would like to thank, uh, on behalf of Ifeza and Virge, uh, our speakers for their interesting uh, presentations uh, and lively discussions. Um, I would also like to thank the audience uh, for their participation. Um, and as I said before, uh, please feel free to uh, share the recording of this event, uh, which you will find on our website and on YouTube. Uh, 